Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub. Uh, tonight we have a great founder and friend, Brandon Cruz, co-founder of Go Health. Welcome, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Uh, so Brandon has a great story uh, that we'll get a chance to hear tonight, but it's also one of those stories that, like a lot of great Chicago stories, have a B2B side to it, which means not everybody has necessarily experienced um, what you all do or know the full story. So today, if someone were to experience, uh, not know about Go Health. How would you describe what you do and what makes you different? I would say uh, generally we're a software company that builds solutions for the future of healthcare. Um, and the reason that's uh, a little broad is because we're in an industry that's changed so much over the last 15 years that we've been in business. We've, we've done a variety of different things, always focusing on kind of moving forward in the healthcare industry, especially related to health insurance, getting people covered and helping them manage that coverage. So, uh, and what kind of, what, what would you give a sense of the scale you're at now? Obviously, you've had great success. People have heard about the uh, interest and in f funding that you've received. But what, if someone were to get a sense of like, you know, how big is Go Health today? What would, what, how would you best describe that? Uh, the best way to describe it without, without telling revenue is uh, we're over 1,000 employees. Um, wow. We've been around for 15 years, like I said. And uh, we've grown every year. I think the last 10 years, we've got a 54% compound annual growth rate. So wow. um, we've been growing for a long time. But uh, I knew it was big. We were together at an event one time, and I said, uh, where's your office? And he said, well, actually, we're in four buildings right now. That's right. <laughs> That's some serious growth. So we'll go back to the beginning. Um, talk a little bit about where you grew up and what were you like as a kid? Uh, OK, so I grew up in Lyle, in the western suburbs, actually. Um, as a kid, I was uh, like any other kid, you know, like doing outdoor act, you know, active things. Um, you know, nothing really unusual. Had had a lot of friends, played sports, kind of the, the, the whole nine yards, like any kid you would expect out in the Chicago suburbs. And you, uh, um, were you a, you know, a good rule follower? Are you a little mavericky? Like, any, any sense where people were like, I can see he's working for himself now. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell. I, I don't really want to tell all the stories of me growing <laughs> up, but I, I wouldn't say I always followed the rules. Um, I never got in trouble, um, so that, that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, like I was, I was a team sports player and everything, but, um, you know, we had our fun and did our own things outside of that. And so you go to Miami of Ohio. Yep. And uh, what, do you, what do you go to study when you get there? You know, this is kind of funny. Uh, when I was graduating high school, I didn't care about where I went to college at all. Um, I had, like, some little businesses on the side, like painting and things like that. And, you know, I was doing fine. And I, I was really, really, like, fiercely loyal to my friends. I just wanted to hang out with my friends. That's all I cared about. Um, I applied to only two schools. I applied to Ohio University and Miami of Ohio. Um, I did my essay from Miami in a typing class. I guess showing my age right now. We had typing class. <laughs> and uh, I did my essay to Miami of Ohio, wrote it once in typing class, sent it in, and I ended up getting a scholarship to Miami. So uh, my friends mostly went to OU, uh, and I chose Miami because I got the scholarship. And uh, you're there now. So you had done some entrepreneurial things, um, but there's a great story um, you once told me about uh, uh, once you got in coding, but you took up coding at some point along the way, right? Yeah, so I was, um, I was one of the few people in my dorm freshman year to have a computer, and I just happened to be good with it. I happened to be good with basic things like, you know, uh, like, like Word, and uh, back then this exp the spreadsheet was Lotus 1, 2, 3, if I remember correctly, and I was just good at it, and people would come to me for help, you know, primarily because I was the one that had a computer, and uh, my younger brother had been very into computers, and I think, you know, maybe just kind of ran in the family. And uh, I went into management information systems because I was, you know, I was very into business and wanted to do something in business, was in the business school, so I took management information systems, which is a combination of, you know, management, business, and computers. All right. So, um, but see, so you, your creativity and entrepreneurism kind of showed up early, I understand it, because didn't you barter your uh, computer skills for some... Uh, with a local business? Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, I, was, I was really into wakeboarding when I was younger. And a wakeboarding facility opened near my parents' house in Cincinnati. And I went down there, and I, I wanted to be able to wakeboard. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, they were just getting started. And I said, how about I build you a website if I can just ride with the guys whenever? I'll, I'll build the website. I'll maintain it. I'll bring people to it. And so I did that. And so I got to wakeboard with the pros pretty much whenever I wanted to, which was, which was amazing. And I became, I, I became a big fan of wakeboarding through that, and I, I got relatively good, and I was actually talking, I have a whole other story, but when we started our business, I was talking to Jamie earlier, who just learned to kite surf. Um, you know, board sports, wakeboarding, kite surfing, surfing, skiing, that stuff, you know, since then has always been a really big part of my life. Just came back from a big ski trip, didn't you? I did, yeah, we take, uh, 
20 guys from around the country that have businesses like ours. And we do a ski trip once a year, and it's, it's like a summit. We, uh, we have business presentations at night, and we ski during the day, and it's our sixth year we've done it. That's awesome. Well, it's, so you get the adventure, you're, you're, you're studying MIS, but you also had a business on the side, right, in college? Yeah, I've had a few businesses on the side. So uh, I had a, a deck washing and sealing business on the side, um, and we started a business my senior year in college called CheapShots.com. Uh, again, showing my age when digital cameras first came out, uh, my business partner today, Clint, and I and two other friends would go around. We'd take pictures in bars and restaurants. We'd hand a little slip of paper that said CheapShots.com, and they would go online the next day and all kind of like look at the pictures, laugh at everybody that was you know, doing stupid things out at night, and you could buy the pictures online. And uh, we did that uh, our senior year of college, my uh, extra semester of college, and you know a couple years after we got out of college. Wow. And so you get out of college, you're doing that. Was it on full time on the side? Uh, once I got out of college, we hired people that we knew um, to run it while we were gone. Uh, we were back you know, in the, in the office in Chicago. We had moved here. We were printing out pictures one by one as they got ordered, and we were mailing them off. And uh, kind of a funny story, I was working for a company called Lante. Um, you know, I know you know Mark Pebby and, and Beck. Mark's been a Chicago founder here. Right. right. And when I was at Lante, I was out at a client site sitting next to a friend of mine. And we had done a party for Anderson Consulting. And the picture orders came through. And in one day, we got 830 picture orders. <laughs> and I had to go home, and I had to print out every single picture, put it in the mail, and send it. And by the time they all got out, I had some addresses wrong. They were getting returned. You know, we were doing all this by hand. And so, uh, you know, what do you do when a business gets really popular? You shut it down. So we shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Instagram and, or and, shut you know, it down. Yeah, I, you know. exactly. So, you know, in a weird way, this is before Facebook or any of this social media stuff existed. And it was a, it was a strangely very social site. It was a place where people would all go the next day to find out what their friends did the night before and share and post about and laugh about everybody's pictures. Um, Should have kept with it. I, I was going to say, little yeah. did you know. Little did I know. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a great story. So... Um, Coincidentally, not to put you on the spot, buddy, but the, uh, you're at Lante. So at that time, Lante, the founder, Mark Tebby, who's been a Chicago founder here, went on to do Answers.com. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Sage, a great Chicago founder who uh, we had a, a few months back, and yourself are all together there. So talk right. about that experience. And, um, uh, you know, it, it seems like it must have been a place that, at least coincidentally or otherwise, really spawned some great things. Yeah, so, you know, we were there, and we were doing all kinds of interesting internet projects at the time, right? It was, uh, you know, Lante was a company that would build really high-end websites, you know, with lots and lots of people on the projects. And I always had the entrepreneurial kind of itch. Like, I wanted to do my own thing. Um, I did an internship one year at GE, which I, you know, it was a great experience. It wasn't for me, though, you know? And uh, I wanted to do my own thing. So on the side, uh, I started kind of putting some things together. I realized that with my, uh, you know, developer skills, I could go out and I could do contract work. And I could also get contract work jobs for my friends. And, you know, they, you know, I'd get paid 85 bucks an hour. I'd pay them 75. I'd make 10 bucks an hour. My thought was, I'll get 100 friends to go do work, and I'll have to do nothing because I'll just take a cut of everything <laughs> I do. So, uh, so I started that, and I, you know, told Sage about it. And the way he tells the story is that... <laughs> this is total I, only one guy's got the mic, so this is, this is the this problem. This is total bullshit. <laughs> But I'm going to tell Andrew's version of the story. Um, <laughs> he says that he looked at it. He said, "Well, if this knucklehead can do it, then I'm going to do it too." <laughs> so, so he left and started, and you know, went to start a company as well. And we were going to start a company together, but uh, he wanted to travel for a while and stuff. So Clint and I ended up starting the company, and, and Andrew started his own company. And you know, I guess at this point, it's just his loss. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's quite. A, I mean, it's pretty amazing if you think about it. On the one hand, you've got um, you know now that Jay Shikawa sold Field Glass for a billion dollars to SAP. Uh, I'm pretty confident that the two biggest and most successful uh, SaaS startups in Chicago are two of yours. It's really uh, impressive, and um, it started, you know, at a place Lante that, um, you know, had some great days but didn't have a great ending. And it really shows you what the human talent must have been like there. I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, Mark Tebby keeps track of them, but there was something like more than a hundred companies that spun out of people that were at Lante while we were there. So wow, it, it's a big number. They, they've they've spawned lots of very successful companies. That's great. It's uh, it's exciting. So your story is an interesting one. You know, one of the things we talk about on Founder Stories is this question of founder market fit, which is it's if you go into a market you don't know, you can you can figure it out, but it takes a lot of work. You have to you have to learn um, the market from the inside out. And uh, one of the things that we've seen in Andrew's story and in John Aiello from Savo Group's story 
is the idea of um, having clients is an interesting way because they educate you. They, they pay you to get you educated. Yep. And so talk a little bit. You guys weren't insurance people. You weren't healthcare people. Um, but you've built one of the great healthcare uh, software companies out there. What, you know, how did that unfold? And, and just talk about that. And really what we try to do in this, this particular segment will get broken out on video later too, which is we try and help people who want to be founders um, think about how do you tackle an industry you don't know? And because a lot of people come in with what I call Newsweek knowledge of the problem, like they read an article, like I got a better answer. And then they don't understand why the market won't buy it. And they keep trying to sell it and they're pushing something and they're kind of pushing rope. What do you, you well, know, talk about how that whole experience for you guys. How'd I you gotta figure tell out? you, like we, we really did it backwards. Um, we started a company and then decided what we wanted to do. So when we first started, it was early 2001. We were, you know, staffing developers, doing projects that we could do on the side for, you know, whether it was former companies of, of ours or, you know, friends, family, relationships we had. And, uh, you know, we started off building websites for people and we, were, we put a business plan together to build a content management system. This was before anything good existed. It was either very high-end enterprise or you had no basic content management system like, like WordPress. So we put all this effort to build a content management system. Um, we went up and down the L in Chicago. We needed salespeople. We wanted to sell a content management system to bars and, and restaurants because they had to change their menus and their calendar events. And so we went up and down the L in Chicago, posted help wanted signs for salespeople. And we were basically followed by you know a security guard, a police officer who took our help wanted signs down. But uh, <laughs> we got back and we ended up getting three people out of that. And uh, we went and sold. We made a little flip book and we went and sold this content management system to bars and restaurants. And uh, we ended up in healthcare because an insurance agent came to sell us our own policies because our old group coverage had expired. And uh, he told us that he was going to get a website built and we needed customers so bad we begged him to build a website. And uh, he said, no, he's got his buddy down the street doing it. And uh, one thing led to another. We eventually got a hold of his insurance company and convinced them that all we do to do is build insurance agent websites. <laughs> and that was, our, that was our entry. You were a specialist in the spend. business? We were a specialist. Yeah, we became a specialist overnight. You know, what we knew is that, you know, when we were going and selling website services to the general population of businesses, everybody's got a cousin or a brother or a friend or something that does it. Does it just turn off? Um, and so we needed a niche. And right. so we decided our niche was going to be insurance agent websites. And that's what got us into the business that we're in today. Well, it's, uh, it's not sexy cocktail conversation, but it's a, it's a hell of a niche that you've built off of. It's interesting. Um, look at a lot of these stories and they start not dissimilarly, our friend Rishi Shah, mm -hmm. you know, when they first started what is a great um, uh, healthcare uh, technology company, you know, they originally had the idea for context media in liquor stores because they were in college and they go to liquor stores and go to bars. And, um, and then he sort of figured out uh, as he started talking to his dad, who's an endocrinologist, that, hey, there's actually a much bigger need for this. It's interesting how serendipitous it is right. that you get that. How'd you guys... Uh, make the move from doing websites, which require fairly low content knowledge of the business, to things beyond that where you become experts in this. Listening to our customers, just like you said. Um, you know, we started off building websites, and then people would say, well, I can't update my website, so we built a, built a service for that. And then we started uh, you know, having people tell us that they didn't have enough customers to their website. So we started doing search engine optimization, email marketing, anything we could do to drive customers. And we started making their websites just focus on converting people into leads, like forms that would fill out or you know, whatever it might be. Uh, as, as people started getting so many customers they couldn't manage them, they said, well, now I have too many customers. I can't pay you for all this marketing. So we said, all right, well, how about we build you a system to manage all your customers? So we started how, building CRM systems. So this is an interesting one. And you make it sound easy because you obviously had clear vision and you guys you know, figured it out. But I think one of the things people are tempted to do is say, we're not in the insurance page business. We're in the website business. Mm -hmm. which is a ruthlessly commoditized dog-eat-dog -dog business. How did you guys decide that you wanted to stay focused in the, in the healthcare and, and you know, which, which, you know, has really turned into a great business, but not the obvious answer if somebody wanted to end up on the cover of a magazine? We just realized that it was really hard to make a sale unless you had some differentiator. There were enough insurance agents looking for websites that if we went and said, I know your buddy can build you a website, but all we do is build insurance agent websites. We'll convert your visitors into customers and you will make money from ours. Or you can go have your buddy down the street do it and get nothing out of it. That was our niche. And so the sales became really easy. And then we also learned that to get insurance agents to buy websites from us, we could go to insurance companies. Is my mic working? Maybe pull it up a little bit. 
Better? Yeah. yeah. We could go to insurance companies and tell them, hey, by the way, if you tell your agents to buy websites from us, they will, you will get more sales. It's not going to cost you anything. Just put a link on your website, send out an email, present it at your sales functions, and you'll get more business as a result of being a partner with us. And so that was our niche, and that's what made it take off. So how long did it take to get to a million dollars of revenue? That's a good question. Um, I need to think back a long time. I think it was like maybe 2001 was... 30 grand, 2002 was probably 250, 2003 was probably 750, 2004 probably is when we got to a million. So uh, given that, like, how did you make it through those early times? Because, you know, percentage growth is really impressive at those stages, but there's not a lot of cash coming in to pay everything and do everything you need. You know, back then, you could be a kid out of college with no credit and get a $60,000 credit limit. And so we just put everything on our credit cards. <laughs> and... Uh, it was fine. And BC had, of champions. Yeah, exactly. And then we had friends that uh, were very supportive of us. Um, we'd go out with our friends, and they'd pay for dinner. And you know, I remember my friend saying, like, we know you guys are going to be hugely successful one day, so we're happy to help you, you know, pay for this dinner, buy these drinks, things like that. Take the people out nice places, I bet. Now, yeah, right? and we've paid them back a thousand times over. So good investment on their part. Yeah, so, um, so talk about that. So you're basically $60,000 taking off credit cards to fund mm -hmm. the business. Was it because you did, didn't want to raise money or you couldn't raise money or wasn't, I mean, wasn't what really was the money around then? Back there? then, it wasn't even a consideration. You know, right. uh, Our dads helped us a little bit in the beginning. They, they invested, um, basically just pretty much blindly giving us money. It's, it's worked out really well for them at this point. But sure. um, yeah, I mean, it was, there, there was no option to go raise money from a former you know, venture capitalist or an angel just wasn't even in the... That must be fun that your parents have made money on this. Yeah, well, yeah. They, they've made their money back. Hopefully they make, you know, when we eventually have a full exit, they'll, they'll be very happy. I always laugh. The story is um, Jeff Bezos couldn't raise money, and so his parents gave him their, like, retirement savings. They worked out okay for him. Yeah, I think they did well. <laughs> um, but it is a big, it is a big bet. So, um, so you and Clint... Uh, started the business together. How did he wasn't Alante though? How did you guys decide to start a business together again? So, so Clint and I met freshman year in college. We lived across the dorm, across the hall from each other in the dorm. Um, so we had known each other ever since. And he in college also was an entrepreneur. Um, when he went home for the summer, he was building websites, doing things like that. And uh, you know, at the time, I think both of us just wanted to start a business, but we're both the kind of people that would rather do it with a partner than uh, than go it alone. Um, especially given you know, the first few years were spent like you know in a lonely living room basically kind of grinding it out uh, so it just it just made for a good partnership you know candidly we both lived by each other we both knew each other both trusted each other and it, it made for a good partnership he was always more on the sales side I was more on the like, operational and technical side so you know to this day it's been a good partnership that's not that easy you see a lot of founders who talk about their co-founders and they may say nice things but most of them aren't around what do you think's allowed you guys to kind of stay together partnered? The fact that we're similar uh, personality and socially, but very different uh, business-wise, right? Hmm. Like I said, he focuses much more on sales. In the earlier years, he was, he was short-term, right? We exist because he was making the sale today to pay the bills tomorrow, where I was always thinking, where are we going to be in three years? What's our strategy? How do we get there? And, you know, the, the, the fact that we're different makes us really good partners. That's great. What's well, uh it's a tribute to both of you that you're, you're together. So I've heard 2005 described as the year that things really started to take off for you. What, what was that? What caused that to happen? What was the alchemy there? So in 2005, again, one of our customers said, you know, your websites are great. Your marketing is great. Um, you've got all these customers out there that are getting more leads than they can handle. The way you could really make money is if you go into lead gen. Like, go into lead gen and take the extra leads from this customer and sell them to that customer. It was, an, it was somebody at an insurance company. And she, she thought that that would be beneficial to her agents. The leads would be more spread out, and then her insurance company would uh, you know, prosper because of it. And uh, so we went into that lead business. We built a platform to take leads from this guy's website that were overflow, sell them to this guy who wasn't getting enough. And through that, we started seeing revenue coming in like, like a lot more uh, reliably than it had before. I guess not more reliably, but like faster uh, in more volumes. And I remember telling my dad, Dad, this new thing we're doing is so amazing. It's going to do $10,000 a day one day. And he's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Tell me when it does. And not even three months later, I sent him the, you know, the credit card transactions for the day. I was like, 10000 And it's uh, gone up ever since. So 
And do you think it was your, what allowed you to make that move? Was it your skill in, in knowing how to convert on the website helped you do it? Or what allowed you to get be successful so fast? We were just grinding. Like we would do whatever we could to be successful and get the revenue there. And, um, you know, we needed to pay the bills. We wanted to grow the business. It was grow, grow, grow at all costs. We never took money out. It was just keep growing the business. So we were, we were fast and nimble. We, you know, we built a good platform and we tried a lot of things and stuck with what worked. Uh, that's great. So then, um, so now you have, you have three business lines today? Sort of. Um, like I said, because the, because the business has changed over the years, we're in an industry that has been, you know, you guys all know the Affordable Care Act has just, you know, ripped the insurance industry and the healthcare industry kind of apart and flipped it upside down. Um, because of all that change, we've, you know, we're more like an incubator <coughs> of businesses now or, a, you know, kind of an umbrella company of businesses. So the three biggest businesses are uh, a lead generation business, uh, we've got an agency marketplace business, and then we've got a solutions business that sells software and services to primarily insurance carriers, but you know other healthcare companies as well. Um, on top of that, though, we also uh, about a year ago started incubating an engagement business. So it's one thing to get health insurance, but it's another to know how to use it. Who should your primary care physician be? How much is it going to cost you to go? How much of your deductible have you used? Um, you know, like telemedicine type features. So if you get a sore throat, instead of having to go to a doctor at a hospital, you can just get on the phone and somebody can prescribe something to you. Hmm. We review your pres prescription medications to make sure that you're paying the right amount. You know, this place versus that place might be a different price. Um, we do claims reviews to make sure that your claims are being paid properly. You've really built yourself around these health insurance companies. We, so we, we really, really have, yeah. Um, and then we've got another business, a newer business that's, uh, we've always been focused on the individual insurance market. This focuses on helping groups manage their insurance, especially yeah. small groups like a lot of the companies at 1871. Interesting. So I want to ask you an interesting question without asking you to violate any confidences. If you look at um, the headlines about healthcare companies, um, what was it? Uh, one of them said they lost $750 million last year. United Healthcare. United Healthcare said that um, they lost $750 million last year, but they can't leave Obamacare because they can't come back for five years. So they're basically, they're, they're living in this, this very interesting time. Um, does, does that give you bigger challenges when your customers are in these challenging positions, or is that an opportunity that you can maybe help them? How do you look at that? It's both, right? The whole Affordable Care Act has been a challenge that's accompanied by an opp opportunity, right? Um, so yeah, so, so a lot of our software and services are provided to help carriers enroll customers. We're in a situation where a lot of the carriers can't afford to take on too many customers. Because United Healthcare, for example, maybe for every dollar they're taking in, they're spending out a dollar plus another 50 cents to pay claims. Mm -hmm. And they're in a real difficult situation dealing with the new law and trying to become profitable with the customers that they've gotten. Uh, so yeah, so it's, 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 helped, it's changed our focus a little bit, um, which is why we incubate all these different companies. If this one's in a, in a tough spot this year, it usually means this one over here is going to have more opportunity. So hmm. that's exactly what's going on right now. So the, the focus shifts. and. You know, everybody would say, like, do one thing and do it well. In an industry that's completely changing, you can't do that. You need mm -hmm. to do multiple things and have a few irons in the fire, and that's what we do. It's, uh, it's interesting. So, you know, you're well known for having raised the big round of capital. Um, when did you raise your $50 million? Uh, 2012. 2012. But without naming names of firms, um, if you're comfortable talking about it, I'd love to hear you almost raise money, and you've decided not to. You kind of got, you, 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 you've, you've gone through some things. Talk about the decision to look at raising money, ultimately not, and why? Because I think those are really important ones for entrepreneurs. So we're, um, we're Midwestern, right? Um, the way people are raising money today is a little different than it was five, six years ago. Uh, we had an opportunity in 2007. Uh, it was our first time like, even thinking about raising any real amount of money. And uh, you know, it was a good introduction to the structure of how private equity companies put deals together. And the longer we went and the more we understood the structure, the more squeamish we got about it. Um, and so we ultimately waited all the way till 2012 to, uh, to raise money. And you know, the deal we did and the deals we would probably do in the future are very standard vanilla deals. There's not a lot of structure in what we did. And um, there's value in that, right? If it's, if it's you know, 100 billion or bust, put a lot of structure in it and you'll blow through all of it, it'd be no problem. But you know, if you're a little more conservative, maybe like we are, uh, having an unstructured deal seems, seems more fair and easy to measure uh, mm -hmm. for us at least. 
So talk about that for a minute, how you, the process you went through, because as I understand it, the, the people you took money from aren't venture guys, they're more buyout growth equity guys. Yeah, so uh, when we went through our process, we wanted to make sure we can distract from the operations of the business, right? We're in a very rapidly changing environment and we didn't want to like blow a year because we looked at raising money and never succeeded. So we brought in six companies. Um, we had them you know, kind of learn about us, bring us term sheets. We chose whichever ones we want to work with. Um, and then we ended up closing the deals. It was a very, very fast and efficient process. Um, and we were very clear up front, like, don't give us all these different structures and everything. Here's the format we want. And we got very similar deals from uh, almost all the companies, actually. And we chose the one that ended up the best partner for us. That's so, and that's Norwest. Norwest Equity. Out Norwest Equity yeah. out of Minneapolis. Yeah, we got Midwesterners. There yeah, you go. yeah, exactly. Um, not to be mistaken for Norwest Venture Partners. Which is their sister company, but now unrelated out of Palo Alto. Yeah. Got it. So talk for a minute, in, I think 2008 you raised the friends and family round. Yep. And I think one of the things that people miss is how nonlinear these things. Yeah, now Andrew and I talked about this with what they did at Kira. You know, there's a time, so J, the public one, so without talking out of school, if you look at Jay Chicago at Field Glass, he sold Field Glass because his venture investors had to get out at the end of their 10 year run of Midwestern company building. He sold it for 210 million to Madison Dearborn. Madison Dearborn let management roll over and put a big option pool out. So they, he sort of re-upped. Um, and three years later, the business had tripled and he sold it for a billion. You know, I think it's not intuitive to people that businesses don't grow at exactly the same rate and, and dollar rate as things go. Um, and sometimes people who want to grow faster don't understand that that doesn't necessarily get you the bigger outcome as you see in Jay's example. So <clears throat> what kind of differential would there have been between, say, without naming numbers, between you raising in 2008, when I think you raised the friends and family round in the 2007, versus doing it in 2012. In other words, what was the benefit of being conservative from a valuation perspective? Just order of magnitude, not dollars. Uh, multiple. Well, the 2008 deal had a lot of structure in it. Mm -hmm. um, so the valuation was probably, artific it was artificially inflated. Um, I would say more than five times differential though. Um, wow. Waiting till 2012, for sure. Wow. But the company grew hugely in those years. Right. Um, the value of having a private company that nobody really knows the revenue is you can decide, we've always been profitable, right? Which helps us. Um, you can decide when you want to push the hammer down, you know, push the pedal down on growth and really go for that and slim your margins down or pull back a little bit and take a lot of profit. And, you know, being profitable and not needing money gives you the luxury of not having to take a highly structured deal and being able to do what you want. And, uh, you know, you look for your growth over time as opposed to your growth quarter to quarter. Right. Well, you guys keep it very private. Any, anything I've ever heard, I've like, if I was in the CIA, I couldn't have a deeper secret than. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's impressive. Now I have to, well, Andrew, sure, I have to sort of throw this out, which is um, I understand that you had an unusual, highly unusual um, financial uh, arrangement for an equity swap that never took place. <laughs> Can you right, tell exactly. that story? <laughs> Andrew and I, way back in the day when we started the businesses, we're, we're going to trade equity. Um, we just never got around to doing the paperwork, but <laughs> um, you know, the offer's still out there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it is it is a small world to think that when you guys were basically, you know, really no one knew you'd be successful, let alone like this, that you were thinking that way. It would have been a hell of a portfolio for anybody to have, that's for sure. The, yeah, well, the goal was, like, if one succeeded and one failed, at least you had a piece of the other. Um, we've been both really fortunate, so. Yeah, you guys have done a great job. So talk a little bit about scaling. You have the operations side of the business, and 1,000 employees is just a daunting number. Um, you look at companies uh, today, you look at Zenefits, for example, you know, and they're in a, a space that's not unlike yours there, because a lot of compliance things they have to work with. Um, you know, it's not, it's easy to blow a tire when you're scaling so fast. Right. Talk a little bit about some of the hard parts and where you, where you maybe had some uh, tense moments and, and, and also how you sort of overcame those. You know, scaling. I'll tell you what I remember being really hard. I, I think like surpassing 50 employees going from 50 to 100 was one of the hardest times because you go from the systems you were using as a startup to, to upgrading the enterprise systems. And that switch is painful. You go from, you know, like me running the finances to having to hire a CFO. And you go from uh, like a very inexperienced person running HR, just, you know, making sure you're following the rules to actually having to look at HR as a, as a function that is strategic to your business. Mm -hmm. 
that size is one of the times, I just remember that as being one of the most difficult because we're changing everything at once. But uh, you know, every year where you have massive increase in, uh, in size, it's difficult. I remember the first year, like our call center, we, uh, we expanded dramatically. We added, in the first year of our call center, we might have had 600 people in four months, three months. Wow. Um, you learn a lot, right? You spend a lot of money, you waste a lot of money, you, uh, you, you uh, have to make sure you're getting the right kind of people. You end up having to hire, you know, to bring on 600, you probably need to hire 1,200 and, and uh, figure that out. So what's, what's been, what have you learned about that, that type of, because, you know, coming up in the engineering side and then looking over here, it's a very different kind of team to run. I mean, bottom line, if you scale real fast, you're going to make money. So it, uh, you're going you're gonna to waste money, sorry. Uh, so if you're in a business where your margins are slim and you want to scale astronomically, unless you have a team that has done this two, three, four times already, you're going to make mistakes, right? We still make mistakes. And, sure. and you know, even in the years that we're growing a little bit versus previous years, like you make mistakes and you have to be, you have to plan for those and, and expect those to happen. Um, you know, fortunately, like I said, we've always been profitable. But if, you know, if you're operating on slim margins, you need to be really careful with how fast you grow because it can, it can come back to bite you. Um, so how many engineers do you have? Uh, around, around 100. Um, we've got a team in Slovakia as well. That's another 30 or so. And your brother, mm -hmm. is your brother CTO? Yes. Yes, your brother. This is the brother who was really good at coding as a kid. That's right. Same you recruited guy. him early. That's I good. I was the CTO until I realized that he was 100 times better than me, <laughs> so I handed the title over. And so 100 engineers in Chicago. Andrew, how many do you guys have? 250. So, I mean, you guys are getting at a scale in these things where that's just a lot of engineers to hire in this town. Um, and obviously you have a high bar. What, how challenging has that been? Is it um, easier or harder than people think to scale engineering here? And, and what kind of insights have you gained? You know, it's hard, but it, it hasn't been impossible, right? You read articles that hiring engineers is the most impossible thing in the world. If you have challenging work in a good environment for them, um, you can hire engineers, right? Um, I think like any job, people just want to like see the opportunity, feel that their career can grow, do interesting work, and work with interesting people. So, where's the best place? Like, where are places you look to say, boy, really? Like in the day, Lante had a lot of great engineers. You'd look to hire people out of Lante. Where do you think the best places are to find good engineers? Referrals from people. Um, <laughs> you did just hire Simon yeah. through me. That's true. <laughs> That's right. um, referrals are always the best. Um, uh, actually. Uh, built in Chicago, uh, a local local SaaS company here has been been very good for us. Um, the Illinois Technology Association has been good for us, um, and then the obvious one everybody uses LinkedIn is is you know an invaluable recruiting resource. That's great. So, what's the long term vision? Like, what can Go Health be? What we really want to do at the end of the day is change healthcare for the better. Right? We want to lower the cost of healthcare in the United States, and we're building all these businesses to do just that. Right? If I can help people turn into real consumers and shoppers of their healthcare, then it will actually affect the healthcare in the United States. And we're trying to get enough distribution and you know, bring out enough people and work with enough, in, enough insurance carriers or enough providers to actually lower the cost of healthcare in the United States. So that's like our very big picture goal. That's a big vision. Do you feel like the healthcare companies um, are you know, receptive to that kind of collaboration? They would love it, yeah. Um, it, it's happened with Medicare Advantage. Um, you know, in Medicare Advantage, the carriers are given $10,000, and they're supposed to manage their customers for something less than that, and they get to keep the profit. Um, it's worked. In the beginning of Medicare Advantage, it, it was difficult. People were losing money all over the place. The carriers were losing money all over the place, and they've brought it down. They've controlled costs, and it works now. Um, it's going to happen in the under-65 individual side of health insurance, too, and, and group as well. So people are going to become shoppers and consumers, and that will bring the prices down. Great. I have a few more questions, but I want to go to the questions from the crowd, so please continue to ask or upvote. Um, but the top question right now is, how do you get the cheapest insurance? I mean, <laughs> that's the easiest question there. Uh, you go to GoHealthInsurance.com and you look. And, <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> All right, thank you, Go Health employees. Um, uh, so what's the roadmap for the next five years for you all as you look at, like, what are the next big, big things on the horizon? Um, you know, a real big thing for us is helping people engage with and manage their own health care. Um, like I said, we've been incubating that company for about the past year. Uh, it's got a lot of traction, um, and we're ready to roll that out nationwide big time. It's a product that carriers can, uh, can work with us on. It's a product directly for consumers, um, and it's, uh, that's probably the future of where we're going. All these carriers are having trouble making money. This product helps them engage with those individual consumers, which they've historically been very bad at, 
and you know, kind of like tightens that relationship and, and will save money for the carriers, make it more profitable, save money for the, for the consumer. Um, that's, that's a big picture thing that we're working on. Uh, helping small groups. Small groups are in a real tough spot right now. Like, because of the new law, a lot of small groups don't know. Should they be providing group health insurance? Should they let people go to the exchange and buy individual insurance? Mm -hmm. What's the best solution? So we've got a, a product for that. Um, and uh, you know the existing businesses, technology to help just insurance carriers better manage their individual population, uh, whether that's enrollment or engagement or membership retention, all of that stuff. Um, and uh, you know everything in between. We uh, we've got those five businesses, so they've all got their own kind of individual roadmap. Have you ever tried one of those things and had it blow up and say, "Boy, this isn't a good idea"? When you were incubating it, we're pretty careful about how we do it. Again, because we listen to what our customers need. Um, I wouldn't say nothing's ever blown up. Uh, back in two thousand seven, uh, we went into the mortgage business for some reason. Um, <laughs> and uh, talk, talk about that one. We, uh, we went into the mortgage business and figured we were good at lead generation and customer acquisition and the insurance side, so let's do it for mortgage because the dollars were a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. um, it was the hot thing. It was We the made hot a thing. mistake. We knew going into it that we were at like the peak of a market and there were, there were kind of like risks and cracks already showing. And we spent about a year and a half to mat before we just pulled the plug. Um, that's probably our biggest mistake. What was, what, was your, what was your meta lesson? I mean, obviously not mortgages again, but what was the... Was there a generalizable lesson you learned there about how you should pick businesses? A couple of them. Um, one, when we went to that business, we built a completely new system from scratch instead of using what we have. Hmm. Um, we spent way more money on the technology development that we should have in that space. Um, we tried to go into it so fast. We did a pretty good job, but we went into a business that was controlled by some really, really big companies, and we thought we'd just walk right in there and make a lot of money. And uh, there was more competition. That what was, was your model? Set. Was it a lead gen model? Was it was it lead gen, yeah. Got it. It was lead gen. And so what made it competitive? Was it just the cost of acquiring or was it yeah. hard to convert? It was just, you know, we were, we were competing with back then. I remember like Lending Tree and Lower My Bills and just these really big companies. And, and we had to go sell to these banks, right? Big, big banks. And that sales cycle was very long and the right. competition was high and uh, the cost of acquisition was, was significant. And we were a very much smaller company at the time. Um, so it was just it was it was hard to compete, and we learned all kinds of lessons. Also, when your gut tells you the market's already mature, don't jump into something that you know is about to hit a wall. Um, right. So boy, that did hit a wall. I remember a guy told me a banker told me he said, "You know we have a problem when a guy uh, he's worked with Toyota Financial, mm -hmm. and Toyota will give you money to buy a car from Toyota, right? Like yeah. all the manufacturers. So they give you really cheap money, and they said in in South Southern California and Florida." something like 40% of people would turn down the financing from the manufacturer, which is subsidized, because they could buy it on home equity. And it was cheaper and tax deductible. Yep. You're like, all right. It was crazy. You're turning down money from people who are trying to sell you things. You know you got crazy. And the crazy thing is the worse credit you had, the more you were worth to the banks. Like this, mm -hmm. the subprime was the like, thing that everybody's going after. Interesting. So. Interesting. Um, <laughs> oh. I'm not going to talk about President Trump, whoever voted this one up. I will not be quoted <laughs> that way. We will cut that from the. Um, uh, so, I, I, no politics, thank you. Um, we'll go as close as we'll go. How would your business model be affected if Obamacare was somehow repealed? Uh, that's that's a that's a long answer. There's there's a lot of uh, elements to that. Um, prior to Obamacare. Our margins were much, much larger, but our market share was much smaller. So we would do probably less volume. Nobody would have subsidies. It'd be hard to buy insurance, um, but we would make more money per customer. Um, that's the very short, simple answer. Um, there's a million little pieces to that, but uh, we'd be fine. Like, Go Health will do fine either way. Like I said, we have a pretty diverse business. Um, no concern. I, um, I wouldn't care if it was repealed or not repealed, to be honest. So I, I'm, I'm going to try and avoid some of the political ones. I don't normally do this, but we, we never had Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders winning before, so <laughs> got to change your world a little bit. Um, do, as you look broadly at the set of candidates, I mean, do, do you have political risk to your business in ways other businesses might not have? I mean, I think the biggest political risk for us is if the country went single payer. Uh, if it was single payer, not only would we be in trouble, every single insurance company would be pretty much wiped out of business. Right. That would be a tough one to work around. Um, so you won't be supporting Bernie Sanders? I will not be supporting his single-payer initiative. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Um, you know, 
the chance of that happening to me seems very slim, but th that's the biggest polit political risk that we have. Um, no, well, there was Medicare, Medicare for all. Um, how do you avoid stagnation and keep innovating to stay out of the competition as the company gets bigger and, and been around longer? It's tough, um, but we know we have to. And again, uh, I, I keep saying this, the reason that we have the separate companies is that those individual companies can focus on what we're really good at. Even though we're diverse as a bigger organization, we know that each element needs to be really good at what they do the best. Um, and so we measure ourselves against anything out there. And we, you know, if we're not better than every single competitor out there, we either you know, stop focusing on it or we make sure we are. And whose job is that to make sure that happens? You know, uh, ultimately mine and Clint's at the top, um, but it, it you know, flows through the individual business unit leaders and you know, all the way to every single person working on that product or project. Um, employees, you have a thousand employees. Talk a little bit about what have you learned about, let's, let's kind of work through the gamut if we can. First, what have you learned about how to recruit and, and sort of identify the right people for your culture? And, and what did you get wrong to figure out how to get it right? For us, we learned early on that to recruit the best people, you need to have your recruiting team in-house. Um, external recruiters are great and they get the job done quickly, but to really recruit the best people, it has to happen in-house. So, uh, so that's number one. Uh, number two, as we've grown, I mentioned you know, HR is one of our big pains. Like, you really need to look at HR as a strategic partner, not somebody that's filing and getting paperwork done. Um, HR is really, um, and, and culture is the most, culture is the most important thing to any business. So how do you, how do you make that come alive? Because that's, Jack Welch was famous for saying the same thing. Um, but it's not obvious to people necessarily how to operationalize that. What does your HR do that's different to make that happen? It's not just, that's why I, I said culture is the most important, not HR. HR is, a, is an important function of that. But if you just say HR, you're in charge of culture, it won't work, right? Like, it has to start with me, Clint, every single person working in our business. They all have to believe in what they're doing and why they're doing it, right? So people should be able to wake up every day and know, like, my ultimate goal, the reason I'm coming to work is this. Um, for us, it's to change healthcare. Our goal is to lower the cost of healthcare in the United States. That's great. Um, talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you, you know, in terms of uh, making that real to employees, communicating, you know, making that real at a broader level. It's one thing when you're 25 people are all in the same office. When you're in four buildings, how do you how do you scale that? It's it's gotten difficult. Um, we try to have we try to have monthly meetings. We don't even get close to doing it. Um, we try to have quarterly all company meetings, but given the size of the firm now, it's really hard to find a place to go put everybody together. So uh, we're using things like, you know, whether it's like blog posts, email inside the company, uh, or we have weekly um, executive meetings mm -hmm. where everybody at the executive level gets together and we have these conversations. We try to disseminate the information throughout the organization that way. Um, it's not easy and, and, you know, candidly, like we're looking for solutions to do it better, whether that's have a, you know, presentation that we can give on video to disseminate to the company or um, other things like that. So uh, I don't have all the answers. We're learning as we go, basically. <laughs> um, one question was, what's the difference between Norvax and Goho? Uh, Norvax was the original name of our company um, way back in 2001 when we started it. We happened to have the name registered as a, as a corporation, so we went with it. It's, uh, it's a name from a college project that we had, uh, had worked on, um, and we always wanted to change the name. And for years and years and years, we were going to and never did. Uh, we got more and more well-known in the insurance community as, as Norvax. And one day in 2008, we said, you know what? We're changing it. We're going to Go Health. And so we went out and bought the uh, domain name GoHealth.com and rebranded the company. And how has that been? Has it taken some getting used to for people, or is it something that worked out pretty quickly? The first year or so it did. Um, we had an agency called Go Health, And so some of our customers were like, wait, Go Health is an agency. Now you're competing with me. You're selling me software, but you're also selling insurance to individuals. Um, so there's a little bit of that that we had to work through, but for the most part, it was, uh, we, you know, we talked to some people that had been through this, and they were like, just rip the Band-Aid off, do it, it'll be done, and you'll be better for it, so. So the two last questions we always ask here are about our com entrepreneurial community, and you know, you started, what, 2001? Yep. So um, you've been at this now for 15 years. Um, Long time. And uh, so one of the things that comes up is, you've, you've seen and been a part of uh, Chicago's entrepreneurial growth. You lead one of the great software companies in your industry and in our town, um, in our city. 
What's your view on Chicago for entrepreneurs today? Uh, and what do you, you know, what, do, what, what are your thoughts for entrepreneurs who think, can I do it there? Should I go to the, the Valley? You know, I think the most important thing for an entrepreneur is to be in a city that they love, right? That could be Chicago, that could be Palo Alto, that could be New York, that could be Nashville, that could be Tampa, right? It could be anywhere. Austin, just go somewhere that you really love and enjoy because to be successful, you got to love what you're doing, right? So if you're, uh, you know, if you're going to a specific city just because you think it has like a slightly better tax code or a slightly better, you know, like slightly better access to engineers or something, I think that's all secondary to you being happy and you enjoying what you're doing. So if you've got more friends in Chicago, you've got better connections in Chicago, you can find everything you need here that you can get anywhere else. And it's a beautiful city and a great place to be. So, you know, I think it's more important that you love what you're doing and being in the location that you love is part of that. Great, and then um, any companies you keep an eye on, you watch younger companies, you look, you say, boy, that makes me excited about their company or for Chicago? Oh, there's so many of them. Um, should I pitch companies that, that sure. are involved in? Sure, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, uh, there's, there's lots of companies that I think are doing well. Um, I think, uh, you know, some of the more exciting ones, uh, we talked about Kapow Events, is very exciting. Um, I think uh, Home Chef, I don't know if anybody's heard of Home Chef. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, prepackaged food delivery company. You spend, you know, 20, 30 minutes making your food. Uh, Home Chef is a company that's doing real well right now. Um, I'm going to totally screw up and forget somebody that's, that's uh, I should mention, but um, there's a company called Creatix that, that Go Health recently, recently purchased. They're a software development shop with some people in Chicago and a team in Slovakia that does some of the best work I've ever seen. I'm excited for them. Super happy we got involved with that company. Um, uh, I mean, there's, there's so many of them, the list is too long to even you know, start. So what's your, as you look at places like 1871, you look at some of the younger folks in here, uh, if there's one thing you would do differently or one thing you'd always do again in terms of advice, the sort of hard-earned wisdom of your experience, is there, you had to pass that along to somebody who's thinking, I'm going to start a company, I've got this great idea, I'm going to figure out this market, I'm going to build the technology, I'm going to sell it. What would that, what would that be? I think the big question I always ask, ask myself, if, if we started the company today and we had access to capital and we didn't have any of our own to put into it, right? You can start a company today and capital is accessible, right? You have a good idea, you're a hard worker, you're a smart person, you can go raise money. I wonder if today I would have raised money early and I wonder what that would mean for me now compared to you know, the way I ended up. Um, I'm really happy I never had the chance to raise money in the beginning, you know, but now I'm 15 years in. You know, I've done very well, but would I have done just as well in five years or would I no longer own a controlling interest in the company and maybe have no value? Or you would have had to know. sell it or recapitalize it in 10 years. Exactly. Um, I think today a lot of people raise money a little too early. You know, they think that raising money is the end game. It's really not. It's the start. You're taking on a partner, and I think people should think about that, you know, long and hard before they just go think raising money is like the first step to their business. That's great advice. Please join me in thanking Brandon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.